Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 293. Today is Sunday the 9th of September 2018, and this interview is with Esther Dyson, who for many doesn't need an introduction. Among her many activities and a rich past, Esther is a trained cosmonaut, author, philanthropist, and one of the world's most active angel investors, focusing on breakthrough efficacy in healthcare. Esther is advisor or on the board of many interesting companies, including 23andMe and Yandex. She's currently executive founder of Wellville, a fascinating nonprofit project dedicated to demonstrating the value of investing in health. In this wide-ranging conversation, we look at exciting new and different business models, how to improve communications and fix the world's spam problem, as well as do a deep dive into the wonderful Wellville project. Welcome to the Minter Dialogue podcast, where we discuss branding and all things digital. I am Minter Dial, your host, and you'll find the show notes on my eponymous site, MinterDial.com. Enjoy the show. Esther Dyson, what a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been following you and I had the recent luck of getting a chance to meet you at COGX. And so here we are with a chance for me to understand a little bit more about what you're up to, Esther. So tell us in your own words who you are and what you do. Okay. I'm the daughter of two scientists. I studied economics. I worked as a fact checker and then a reporter for Forbes. Then basically I was in the tech world running a conference and a newsletter for 25 years. Then I sold that. I spent six months training as a cosmonaut in Russia was an active angel investor and then began to find health and healthcare more interesting because they were useful. So then I asked the obvious question based on my journalist training, why are we spending so much money fixing people who get sick instead of helping them be healthy in the first place? So that's really what I've been doing for the last five or six years. It's a glorious journey, Esther. And I, I mean, at some level, all the same, writing has its value, visiting space and doing space has its value. Did you have to learn Russian? And what was the thing that made you want to become a cosmonaut? Oh, okay. So I learned Russian in high school. Uh, sure. And I'd been going to Russia since 1989, where I spent a lot of time with the local IT industry. But the thing, the reason I did the cosmonaut training was both I wanted to learn about space plumbing And I wanted to learn about Soviet Russia, which was just disintegrating in 1989. Mm -hmm. But in the space industry, the the place they do the training was basically a government-closed village. And I did indeed get to experience Soviet Russia. Well, at the same time, uh, they've always managed to somehow, I I think anyway, between NASA and the uh, Soviet-Russian space units, plus the ones in France... They've still managed the scientists stay together. Yeah, so that, this dates back to my father, who was a physicist slash mathematician in England. He wanted to go to Russia to be a mathematician. Later on, he kind of changed his mind. But the the space people were always much closer than their governments were. Mm. So at least, uh, Esther, I can say that we share a passion for the Russophile life I, too, studied Russian. So in your broad sweep of of companies, you come across, Esther, because some of the things that I really enjoy looking at in tech, I mean, there's such a broad number of tech areas. But of all the areas that you get a chance to see, from your viewpoint, which of the ones excite you and do you feel have the most potential for radical change in our world? Well, the ones I like... It varies. I mean, sometimes I'll just like a person and think, you know, this isn't that exciting, but they're really good at implementing it. But what I love are new business models that make sense, that align interests long term. So I've had many attempts. The clearest one was a company called Boxby. I think senders should pay to send email and the recipients should have the ability to charge. And that would solve so much of the spam problem. It would make people more thoughtful in the communications they send. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can 
with your friends and you know, if you're looking for business, you can make the emails free for yourself as a recipient. If mm. you could also, in theory, charge five hundred dollars for an ex-boyfriend, thirty dollars for anybody who wanted to submit a a, a, a pitch, and if they were from India, you could make it five dollars. Or, you know, mm. this is where you get creative and you have to design the software to make mm. it simple and not too just too intrusive. Mm. To some extent, that's what LinkedIn does, but it doesn't mm. do it in a very granular way. Mm. Well, I, would, I would argue that they, they could really improve all the same. Because right now, there's too many people that have too many links, and, and it's sort of a lot of wasted space, not to mention spam. Yeah. I mean, also, I think if I were running Facebook, I'd do something where a friendship was default two years, and after that, you could renew it. Oh, yeah. But you could sort of just delicately <laughs> lose people yeah. who you didn't actually know that you befriended in a fit of having Lightness. sat next to them on the train right. or you know, yeah. who knows. Yeah. And it wouldn't query the other person. It would just sort of gradually yeah. remove them. And yeah. you could always re-up. Well, I, I feel like when you, you send a message and, and whatever the platform and they don't reply – you know, well, wait a second, there's no worth there. And we should just, that, that should maybe make the two years 18 months or 12 months. And there's little other techniques that make it quicker. Yeah, I mean, again, you can you can take that idea and you can do it better or worse. And the people who do it well will will be more successful. But you can also have a default and let the user change it. You know, for this person, I'll keep them even though they didn't reply or whatever. So we, we're talking about, health just now and maybe the human condition otherwise and how tech can be helpful i imagine you also believe that tech is part of the problem and is creating some of the health issues that we have today is that something that's a, is that a fair statement yeah that's a fair statement but i wouldn't blame tech i would blame a lot of things including our education system including a bunch of the incentives or business models that make tech a problem. I mean, tech inherently is is not a problem. It's tools. Right. The, the challenge is selling people's time. You know, I had hoped people would be more aware of some of these issues mm-hmm. for themselves. The, the real challenge is how do you give people the tools and the insight to manipulate themselves rather than letting advertisers and other people manipulate them. But there's, there's, I mean, again, tech is not the problem. Some tech businesses and people and business models are, including if you, if you buy, if you go to the grocery store and you buy some food, it's going to have a label on it, and you trust that the label is accurate, and if it's inaccurate, ultimately the FTC or the FDA can go after them. In advertising, the supply chain is is completely bogus and and filthy, and there's all these different advertisers, some of whom are spam, some of whom are malicious, that are simply not vetted Mm. by the owner of the website, Mm. and it's their duty to do that. Well, the issue right now is that a lot of these platforms, their only business model or their only revenue is on advertising. Right, and so they want more sleazebags. And, right. But it's, it's not just these platforms. I mean, you, you go to the New York Times okay. and they have, right. I mean, Business Insider has Taboola and all those guys. And it's, it's just it's a supply chain problem in a sense. All right, so you and I, let's say we're brought up initially pre-internet times. And at some level, I feel that a lot of my peers don't really understand to what extent they're being bamboozled and are the media still, you know, it's a not a trite statement, but maybe we are responsible for the advertising model as well. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm not saying it's all the other people. Right. Yeah, and, and the advertising model is not new, but the... Right the chain that long supply chain i mean just as in the past you didn't hire chinese child laborers you hired people in your own town and Mm -hmm. if you abused them people knew about it Mm -hmm. but now everything is so attenuated that things are going on that it's easy to turn a blind eye to 
So with your journalistic background, Esther, I'm uh, wondering, you haven't mentioned like journalism tech per se, but what do you think is, how would you explain the problem of journalism today? And do you see anything, any different technologies or initiatives that, that you think are, are going to be the right way to approach the issues that we have in media today? Uh, so are you talking about, quote, fake news? Or well, are you I, talking about journalism being almost unfundable? Right. Or well, more about the, the unfundability, the business model being based on advertising too often, therefore eyeballs, and therefore no... I mean, like it or not, the business model is philanthropy. And that makes us uneasy because as neoliberals who believe in free markets, we can't figure out that that's sustainable. But the fact is that it's more sustainable than leaving it in the hands of government. Or Mm. there's a big difference between media and journalism. And I think, Mm. you know, in order to have optimism, you have to have faith. And I think I'm also... I'd rather have faith in some philanthropists who fund journalism than in the ability of either governments or business to really, you know, there there are gradations of this, Mm -hmm. but you have to put philanthropy in there if you want to have any faith in the future. Well, you are a prime example of that, Esther. Uh, uh, We were just sharing before how you are one of the most active investors in the world in your activities presumably not all necessarily philanthropic, of course. Mostly not. Mostly not. <laughs> but um, within all your activities, you, what, is there a specific type of technology that, that really stands out and saying, well, huh, that's, the, I, that's where I see the most interesting initiatives coming from? No. I, I'm more interested in business models or sectors or, mm. or, if you like, problems rather than what it... The technology is being used. Is, yeah. And, I mean, so the very first company I was involved with that was a startup was FedEx. (laughs) And I love logistics and Slack and the importance of density and real-time dynamic scheduling and stuff like that, which is not terribly fashionable but really interesting. And on the other hand, you know, I like, again, new business models – I'm really excited about a company I've invested in called Supportive, which is a crowdsourced mental health peer-to-peer counseling tool, but it also has paid counselors to moderate the discussions. Mm. And we've been having this... So they price by the minute, Mm. and your attention, you you pay. And obviously the hope is to get health plans and other things like that to pay. Uh, I think it would be more – so this is my idea. It's not their idea. But I think it would be more useful, for example, to do it in 15 or half hour – 15-minute or half-hour increments because micropayment is very discouraging and it's sort of distracting. And the last thing you want to do when you're getting sucker from another human being is to be thinking – Shall I let this guy go on for two minutes? or yeah. you know. So my idea is you buy f- for 15 minutes or half an hour, and then if you don't use all the minutes, they get donated to somebody who needs them That's more nice. than you do. Mm-hmm. And that, that makes you feel you haven't wasted the minutes, mm-hmm. but you also aren't Pressure tempted to waste. Them, but yeah. yeah, but you're also not tempted to waste them yourself. Like, well, I might as well use the last fa- five minutes because I paid for it. Right. And right, then it's a waste of that your time, your time, yeah. yeah. Mm. So it's things like that that mm. fascinate me. Mm. Doing, just thinking cleverly about how to design things in a way that aligns interests and fosters the best behavior and so forth. So when you say fostering the best behavior uh, and the philanthropy you mentioned earlier, is there a common thread to the purpose of what you're doing? Obviously, when you're making an investment in a commercial entity, you kind of want to make money. So you're going to look for maybe a great business model, but do you feel that there's a some kind of purpose behind, or is there a link between the type of initiatives you do? So long ago, before anyone ever called me a philanthropist, and I still somewhat blanch at the word, 
I used to say, if I was a maid, I'd like a dirty room. And I used that to explain my fascination with Russia. Basically, I like to fix things or to keep things fixed that seem to me to be wasteful and disorderly and stupid. Mm. Not, I'm not looking for rigidity. I mean, what I like is flexibility that, so if you know what simulated annealing is, you shake things up and then everything settles into place in the very best place it can get to. And then after time, you need to do that again because as circumstances change, the any arrangement that's optimal at one point in time is probably going to need to be changed sometime in the future. So you want this cycle of disruption and what some people would call explore, exploit. Mm -hmm. Explore for the best, figure out what's best, exploit it for a while, then reassess as things mm -hmm. change and, and keep doing that. Uh, in terms of long-term purpose, so I think global sickening is a more immediate mm -hmm. and dangerous problem even than global warming. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not alive, mm -hmm or so sick we can't appreciate a healthy environment, that environment isn't going to do as much good. So if we take specifically the United States, but you presumably have a lot more statistics behind it, with life expectancy coming down for the first time over the last few years, as I understand it, uh, and possibly even also in the UK, w w w does this mean an indictment to the Western system of medicine? No, it means an indictment to the Western system of social values, of investing or not in education as well as health care. Uh, it means a culture, yeah, a culture where we no longer respect family, friendship. I mean, it, it varies where advertisers tell us the way to be successful is to buy this perfume or this particular deodorant or you know, wear this thing and you'll be cool. Uh, there's some anecdote recently I loved where this kid comes home and says, the other kids made fun of me because of my sneakers. And the dad says, so what did you say? And the kid says, I told him that was stupid. <laughs> Good for the kid. Uh, so it's it's a combination of a lot of different toxic things, including toxic food supply. Right. So when you say education, what do we need to do to educate? I mean, if you had a magic wand, I mean, presumably Wellville's part of this, but if you were in school and you, and you had an opportunity to influence the curriculum, what would you be doing? Well, at first I would educate the parents. And so I have this thing called Wellville, and it's not that we can waltz in and say, hello, we're I'm a nice white lady from New York City, and I'm going to tell you how to be a better parent. But if someone signs up for a diabetes prevention program, that program can also teach them how to interact with other people, how to cook and eat with their family. It's, there are lots of ways to bring people together and to re-knit the social fabric without saying, I'm here knitting the social fabric for you. Right. As soon as you kind of force it on them, their ability to learn and absorb and engage it is, is less. Well, I mean, in a sense, it's we, Wellville, we're not going out and talking to the communities. We're talking to the leaders. So to use a cliche and extend it, we're not giving them fish. We're not even teaching them to fish. We're giving them advice on to how... We're giving them advice on how to build their own fishing schools. Because when we leave, they need to have those institutions and those trained people mm -hmm. doing it locally, and they need to own them themselves. Yeah. If you go in and give them something, especially if it's only a program, when you leave, it disappears. No one follows along. All right, let's talk about Wellville, Esther. So this is uh, a project, obviously, is sort of more your most contemporary thing, the thing that drives you the most. Tell us, as far as I understand... Tell us what is Wellville and uh, and where are you in the program? Yeah, so program. Wellville is my full time job. First of all, I founded it kind of by mistake in 2013 when I had to give a speech. So I thought, 
I would talk about how somebody should build something that was kind of like an X prize, but for health instead of for health care, and realized saying somebody else should do this was not as compelling as saying, ladies and gentlemen, I want to announce. I'm doing this. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I did. And then I had to figure out, okay, I have this basic idea, small communities that are discreet so that whatever happens happens within them and all these different parts complement one another. So physicists talk about critical mass, but what they really mean is critical density. It's mm-hmm. the critical density that makes these things mm-hmm. interact and do and, and profundity but chain reactions mm-hmm. and so forth. So they had to be small because my resources are limited mm-hmm. and also I just figured it would be much easier than taking on Newark as Mark Zuckerberg discovered. Hmm. And they had to have some entity that already existed. Again, it wasn't we would waltz in and help mm-hmm. people. We wanted to find people who were trying to build something mm-hmm. and so help. Like a base already to work on. Yeah. So we, so I had a bunch of these brainstorms, and at one of them, this guy showed up in a, a blazer and cocky slacks, which is not. My people mostly show up in hoodies and sneakers. You're talking about a prepster. Yeah, and he asked totally reasonable questions. How are you going to fund this thing? How are you going to measure your success? Uh, what are you actually going to do, etc.? So we went to lunch, and we had a really nice conversation. It turned out he had been at Cigna in public health previously. Cigna's an American insurance company. And... He still didn't go away, so I hired him as the CEO mm. because I've seen so many businesses, for-profit and not, where you know, somebody had a good idea and then destroyed it by mm. doing it by themselves. Mm-hmm. So Rick is a great counterpoint, and he is now the CEO. God bless him. Mm. So we got – we started creating an application form for communities, and – then in the spring of 2014, we kind of sent it out, and we used his connections and mine, sorry, to uh, to get it out. And to our amazement, we got 42 different organizations applying. So it had to be under 100,000 people within the U.S., and you had to. It was quite a lot of work. You had to talk about your demographics and what your institution had already done, and what success it had, what your goals were. So we arranged, we read them all and arranged to visit 10 of them the summer of 2014 and picked five. And do you feel that the giving them the work in the beginning was uh, a way of sort of self selecting? Uh, and, And the notion of the size and the base, these are practical issues at some level you were mentioning because of either budget or the base, there's something that's existing. Uh, have you what learnings have you had now about the selections you've made and what you're going to be doing for the future? In other words, you're going to keep the same kind of process and the initial criteria. So, first of all, constraints are always helpful mm-hmm. because they they give you design constraints. You just it means you don't get too many. We were delighted with how many we did get, and yeah, it's sort of selected for people serious enough to do the work. Uh, So our goal is not to go find more communities. And so that question isn't... We did actually switch one out because it's like you're an executive coach. Someone hires you to help get more healthy. They tell you to go to the gym. You don't go to the gym. They call you. You don't answer their calls. You're not responsible. Yeah. So... and. The one that we switched out, we replaced with North Hartford, Connecticut, that didn't quite fit the, you had to be not part of a larger place. But that's the advance. So at this point, I'm funding Wellville, the team of six. I'm not funding the efforts in the communities. They, they need Part of the discipline is they need to be good enough to raise money mm-hmm. from, you know, and often they're better at raising money than they are at spending it. And so our goal is to help them deserve the money that they raise, in a sense. Anyway, 
so our mission is to show that this works and then have people copy us rather than for us to go do it again and again in other places. So, I mean, well, we're not talking about a franchise. Are we? How, how would you describe the, the, the business model, per se? Um, so it's a nonprofit. Our activities are funded by me, the community's activities. We help them raise funding for but they're funded by them. And the business model is philanthropy. And when you look at these five different Wellvilles, how different are they and what kind of lessons are you learning from them? So they're about as different as five children, <laughs> you know, and they're they're different ages slash stages. Uh, they're all they all have a missing middle class. They all have obesity, opioid use, mental health, uh, child abuse. I mean, so do most places in the right. United States, right. and they have different levels of interest in different. They have different focuses, and they have different amount of capacity. And, I mean, the clearest thing is it's not the same program in each community. Mm-hmm. What we're trying to do is help the ones that have some chance of succeeding succeed more, and that sort of spreads. It, it's, it's not like you have to have a pre-diabetes program in every community. Right. If the pre-diabetes program is poised to succeed, go after that, mm-hmm. and then its positive impact will spread. The hospital will decide to use it. If you have a really good homeless program, like in Lake County, focus on that because, again, the the hospital will support it. The health insurance plan will help to fund it, and it will set an example for the schools or, you know, whatever. But what you need is people to feel a sense of agency is success that spreads more than the particulars of the individual pro- protocol slash curriculum slash program design right. but the goal is so just as people get addicted to drugs and to instant gratification communities can get existed to pilot programs and what you want to do is give them a long term purpose mm-hmm. where they focus on working towards long term change rather than this instant gratification of we got $50,000 to hire a part-time person to run a dance program for women. So do you, I was wondering how much technology is a part of any of it in terms of their sharing and creating community, is that part of it? Uh, Well, yeah, we use some really advanced technologies like group conference calls. (laughs) Wow. Um, They... I mean, fundamentally, this is not a tech program. It's not, oh, we brought you some Fitbits right. so that you can monitor yourselves and behave. We we use sort of your standard technology, and you know, different institutions obviously use apps and databases and so forth. Uh, but it's, and I think long run, there's kind of a combination of an app plus a in real life I'm on the board of Meetup, or I was on the board of Meetup. It got acquired by WeWork. And this notion of people meeting together and forming a group, it's not an event so much as it is a continuing... Relationship. Yeah, connection. Uh, So that, to me, is important. Technology can help, but it's, it's not about looking for the best tech to do something. You mentioned before the, the challenge we have of educating everybody, and I fully subscribe to that. If I were, had a magic wand, by the way, I would make sleep courses a requisite class. Yes, and uh, if I had my way, I would have the high schools start two hours later. But uh, the important thing to list, to understand is if if it's about what I want, it's not going to be successful. Right. Uh, but obviously it's not... If, if it was only about what they wanted, we wouldn't be adding any value. Right. So it's a, Finding it's a the reason communication. Why they want to get it. Right, and also when you asked about learning, they they learn a, so much from one another. You know, mm-hmm. oh, we should find out what those guys are doing in class. Up, that's a really clever idea. Mm-hmm. And so once a year, the community leaders gather in one of the communities at a meeting that we host and and that we also fund. Uh, the coordinator in each community 
they get on a call the first Wednesday of every month that we don't so much lead as, as facilitate. to facilitate. Yeah. And they begin to know one another and to, again, you know, we'll help the YMCA in Hartford, talk to the YMCA in Muskegon and stuff like that. I'm pretty sure that stress is one of the biggest problems that health has. And you've also mentioned the notion of meeting meetups and getting together. And I also feel loneliness in this tech in world. And I'm not really, you know, I, I don't know. I have no, I'm, I'm gormless when it comes to this. But which do you think is the bigger ill? It's sort of like asking, is your heart or your lung more important? Uh, there's a guy you should have on your podcast called Johan Hari who wrote a book called Lost Connections about precisely this. And, I mean, there really isn't one that's more important to the other. They're, they're so correlated in, in all directions. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have parents who don't have enough money, so they're hassled and stressed, and so the kid feels insecure and everybody eats badly because they can't afford it, and there's not enough transportation, and then the schools aren't very good, and the kid's distracted because it hadn't had enough sleep. And so you start eating badly because that's a sort of a little comfort right. food. And because that's all the food that's available. And so people are fundamentally damaged by the time they get to high school, which is why you asked me if I had all the power in the world. I would start with the nurse family partnership for everybody so that the mothers, and this is when you can, you don't quite waltz in and train them, but when you find out they're pregnant, they tend to want to get in touch with the healthcare system, and that's the, the moment at which you, it. yeah, and that's the point at which you say, look, it really would be better if you stopped smoking, and here, here's how, and ideally, you know, here's a nurse to give you advice, but here's also a group of other pregnant women that you can commiserate with. And by the way, if you're on drugs, you know, let us give you some medication assisted treatment, but also some counseling. Uh, ironically, my aunt in England was what at the time they called an almoner for the National Health Service. It's now called a medico social worker, but her specialty was unmarried mums. Mm. And she did precisely this. And when she died a few years ago, a bunch of the kids whose mothers she had counseled came to her funeral, and that was pretty wonderful. I bet it was. It feels like uh, that for women, they become pregnant, they have this openness. I kind of feel that men need to, have, need to have a thing that provokes. Yeah, well, so for men, it can be prediabetes. Uh, it can be... The first heart attack. <laughs> the first heart attack. I mean, but also, there's an outfit called Family Bridges that I love, and they do, you can call it couples counseling. There, it comes in different forms, but fundamentally, it's about communication skills. Mm. You know, there's this myth that you just need to find the right one and marry them. But... A marriage is also something you construct, mm -hmm. and you construct it by compromise and better communications and saying things like, this is so trite, but it makes me unhappy when you leave the toilet seat up as opposed to, you're a jerk. You <laughs> Put it down. Like yeah, and just, I mean, it's interesting. I've always thought what you really want to do is show your partner your, your heart monitor and say, when you say things like that, my blood pressure goes up. And, you know, I'm not trying to be mean, and I love you, but this is a fact. can we work together on having a way of communicating that doesn't make my blood pressure go up? And that's much more likely to lead to good results than, you jerk, I told you. Maybe the underlying thought, and it's a topic of much interest for me, is this notion of empathy and the ability for us to construct more empathy and bridges one another by understanding what the other one's going through. Yeah. And, I mean, this is useful whether you're managing a shoe store, yeah. talking to your boyfriend, trying to explain to your kid why something is a bad idea, and, and at the same time 
giving the kid enough agency that they can go explore and make a few mistakes right. without, you know, children are either way under or way over managed by and large. And it's a problem in both directions. Esther, if you had, uh, if I were an entrepreneur in front of you, what kind of advice, what's the first thing you come to mind, you know, with all the people you see and the investments you're making, is there one thing that stands out that you always want to say to an investor or, uh, sorry, an entrepreneur? Um, well, the first thing I will ask usually is, where do you come from? And that's a subtle or not so subtle way of trying to find out what motivates you. You know, are you trying to please your parents? Mm -hmm. Were you a science geek? I mean, the way they answer also Influence. tells you something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do they answer with their nationality or their high, their college training or you know what? And if they say, "I've always wanted to be a CEO," that's a very bad sign. <laughs> Why? This is a problem that excites me. I want to build something to solve it. And if the best way to solve it is for me to be CTO and not CEO, that's fine. Right. But someone who focuses on the role rather than the purpose mm -hmm. is going to get distracted. This is like also someone who says, well, I want to be the number one in. Yeah. Oh. All these things. So, Esther, thank you for being on the show. Absolute pleasure to have you on. What would be the best way for anyone to participate, track you down, connect? What, what's your preferred way? Huh. Um, honestly, email is the best because then I can write an email back, including saying, thank you so much, but I'm really not interested, as opposed to LinkedIn. We have to go to a website. I mean, right. just, ah, Busy. so you're calling my bluff. What is my email address? <laughs> it's edison at dot. Net. And check out wellville.net first because, again, we're, n we're not a place that's going to help you beta test your product mm -hmm. or you know, if you give us your health app for free, basically it may be free and that we're not paying for it, but if we're going to help you, we're going to have to help distribute it, and that is a huge cost. And we have – we and the communities – especially have lots to do with our time so mm -hmm. just to warn you right well so a uh when someone writes to you or to anybody uh, uh, do your homework go check out what's interesting to them and don't just write because it interests you as the person sending it and then uh be thankful for someone who replies so i mean this is the message i give to anybody which is you know write the note in a way that makes it clear that you know who I am and why I might be interested and why it should be interesting to me. Though I'll tell you my, my all-time favorite one, someone sort of half got the idea of you need a sponsor. So he wrote and said, my aunt saw you on the television and said I should write to you. <laughs> this dude is he's just real. <laughs> Esther, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much. It was fun. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please like the handy Facebook button. Or better yet, head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. But first, relax to Josh Sachs's finger paint. Oh, fill me with all your colors any different way to rid me of the gray. You mentioned in your lack of self security. Oh, I wouldn't care about the art form as long as you would feel warm, wrapped in canvas. Hold me tightly, slowly. We would paint a lover's portrait with all your favorite shades. Rich.
Gorgeous in our palms make colors blend and look ugly in the end. But they're pretty in their own disgusting values. We'd hang our portraits in the hallways, make our house guests cringe. Oh, I wouldn't care. Show.